Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, um, some of you may have noticed that these are a little bit nil. Um, it's kind of one of those funny things that happens. Um, uh, when I was ordained back in uh, 2008, let's see, how old was I? I was, uh, I was, I had just turned 33, and, um, I had already had some gray hair for a while. Um, it really started when I was somewhere in my early 20s, like 22, 20, 21 years old. Uh, I started getting these gray hairs. I could tell that because when I was at the barbers, uh, you know, they'd cut my hair, and I would see, in the midst of all my black hair, <laughs> these little things of gray. I'm like, what is the deal with that? I'm 21 years old. I should not have this. Um, and then, you know, okay, years later, I'm ordained, and, um, and then... Um, the people in the congregation started to say stuff like, look, Pastor, we're turning your hair gray. <laughs> well, okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm turning my hair gray. That's, um, um, yeah, my hair's turning gray. What's going on? I'm, you know, I'm still not that old. Why is that happening? And, you know, just the march of time, right? Just different bodies react differently to different sorts of things. Well, about a year and a half ago, um, I was at the, uh, the ice cream hymn sing for um, our music program, where we, we raise funds for the music program. And, um, and I was sitting off to the side here, and Alan and Sandy were sitting uh, on the same queue over here. And, um, and in the middle of, this, um, of the hymn sing, Sandy um, leans over to me and she says, Pastor, you need to have your eyes checked. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? I can see this just fine. <laughs> All right, so I went and got my eyes checked, and sure enough, the, the eye doctor said I needed to start wearing readers, and not like not, not like major magnifying glasses, just like the you know the lowest um, the lowest one, and, and so I picked those up and I've been reading with them. Well, I found actually my eyes get a little bit weird when I'm up front here trying to read the prayers to you all, and it's so. Sometimes I mix up letters and I mix up words, and you know I'm aware that I do that. But um, so every now and then I'm going to be using my glasses, um, and it's very uncomfortable to do that um, because you know I'm, I'm I'm young. I don't need glasses, or you know <laughs> because for me it's not like it's not. I know some of you have had glasses your almost your entire lives, but this is a new thing. This is like wow, I'm getting old. I got old man glasses. <laughs> From the pharmacy, <laughs> you know, not even from like the prescription. They're like so. Um, and then I had some friends here on Christmas Eve, and it's wonderful to have friends from the community, you know, friends of the family who come to worship. And they were all giving me a hard time because on Christmas Eve I had to use my glasses to make sure I could read okay. Um, but it's really uncomfortable, you know. I, I used to be very comfortable. I didn't need any anything to, to, to read with. I didn't need you know. I didn't need to worry about my hair being gray or anything like that. I was you know, young, but now I'm like moving into this place of uncomfortability. And that's a natural part of life, isn't it? I mean, we're all going to be growing older, and we're, you know, we're all going to be having changes happen to us. And that's just a part of life. So in some senses, we need to let go of the past in order to embrace what is coming in our future. And that's, um, that's a normal thing for all of us to encounter. As a matter of fact, in our lives, we, um, we have this happen all the time. And uh, there's times when we're like uh, in the peak of our lives and everything is wonderful. Everything is great. Everything's going so wonderful. And then when, then when you start to think, you start to think, well, when's the other shoe going to drop? You know, when's the other foot going to drop? So, and then it happens. And you go down and you're kind of in a valley and it's this time of, man, nothing's going right. This is happening and that's happening. And, oh, and then... Everything's great again. Everything's wonderful again. Everything's going just the way it should be. And then you're down in the valley again. And it's this cycle in our lives where if we're up and we're down and we're up and we're down. There's actually a term for it. It's called the hedonistic treadmill. It's in our lives when we're going along in our lives and everything seems like it's just great. There's some foreboding within us that thinks that something bad's going to happen. And then something bad happens because inevitably something bad happens. Uh, we're, we're living our lives and everything's not going to go our way. But then we think we're in this battle. 
But then something great happens, and we're way up here again, and then we're down, and it's just up and down and up and down, and it's kind of like when you're on a treadmill, and, and you know you're running along, and okay, by the time for the next stage, and it starts to go up a little bit, and oh, it's really really hard, it's really really hard, and then you go okay back down to normal, okay. You know that's basically how we're living our lives, going up and down and up and down. So a lot of it has to do with basically just accepting that life is going to be as life is going to be, and that sometimes there's ups, sometimes there's downs. And, and not only that, but God's will is at work in our lives. In one way or another, God's will is at work in our lives. But not in the way that we necessarily think, that God is calling us to a comfortable life. As a matter of fact, if you look back in the history of the people of Israel, you're going to see that God does not always call us to a comfortable life. <coughs> Excuse me. That a lot of times, if you look back in the history of Israel, it's the times of comfort, it's at the times when everything seems to be going just great, that they get themselves in the worst trouble. That they start to do what seems good to them in their own eyes. And it's just back and forth and back and forth. The people get comfortable, and then they get um, they get taken over by some other nation or some other country, or they get attacked, and then everything is okay again afterwards for a little while after they're delivered. And then it goes back and forth in this cycle. In in the disciples' lives, it's actually the same same sort of thing, where they were all fine on their fishing boats. Everything was going just fine. They maybe weren't rich, but they weren't poor. They were able to feed their families. Peter had a family, and his mother-in-law was doing just fine, and, and everything is wonderful. Um, and then Jesus calls him to ministry, and he moves from this place of comfort to this place of discomfort. And things start to go a little bit differently than you'd think. Um, his mother-in-law gets so sick she almost dies, and it's Jesus who goes and, and heals her. Uh, Jesus dies and, and is resurrected and sends the disciples out to, um, to preach to the nations. And what happens? They get thrown in jail. They get persecuted. Again and again and again, they face these obstacles. They're called from a life of comfort to a life of discomfort. And going out and, and, um, and doing the will of God, which isn't an easy thing. And even in our reading for today, Peter is standing before Cornelius. In, in front of a, a foreigner, in front of someone who worships a foreign god, that he is able to preach the good news. And that's, um, and, and that's the cycle of his life, where it's a time of comfort and then a time of discomfort. And the time of discomfort allows him to preach to someone that he wouldn't normally have been able to preach to. Here's Jesus, 30 years old, Time of comfort in his life. As far as, as far as we know, he was completely comfortable, so comfortable that we don't hear a thing about him. As a matter of fact, um, his, we hear about his birth. Uh, we hear again when he's like, I don't know, 12 years old or so, when he gets lost to the temple, a time of discomfort for his parents, right? And then we don't hear from Jesus again until he's about 30 years old and he's baptized. And he's called once again from a place of comfort to a place of discomfort. And now Jesus is called from a comfortable life in the town of Nazareth, uh, in whatever trade he had taken on, to then go out in the wilderness and be without food and without drink. So hungry was he that the, the devil tempted him with turning rocks into bread that he might eat. Jesus was called to discomfort, so much so that, that when he was asked, where are you staying? Jesus says, there's no place for the Son of Man to lay his head. Foxes have their dens, and, and, but there's no place for me. Called away from comfort toward discomfort. Sure, there's some little comforts in his life. Um, the woman that comes to him, Mary, the, the sister of Martha, who breaks open a jar of nard of costly perfume and anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair showing intense love for him. That was a little comfort in the midst of a very uncomfortable life. Again and again, it's the people in Jesus' life that reach into the discomfort that he's feeling and invite him in 
to share with them, to share a meal with them, even though even at the meal he'll be challenged by Pharisees and Sadducees and those that uh, would challenge his teachings. We too are called from comfort into a time of discomfort in our lives. What did we sing before we began with the gospel reading? Speak until our hearts are stirred. When our hearts aren't being stirred, we're just sitting there, it's all wonderful, everything's great, but no, God, speak until we're stirred to move from our comfort to our discomfort, to go out and do something. This is what God is constantly moving us to. Today is the feast day of the baptism of our Lord. Did you know that there's generally three accepted other types of baptism? Uh, well, there's three generally accepted types of baptism, right? Water, and we do that in different ways, either by immersion, full immersion. A little sprinkling on the head uh, is another way of doing that. But water is one form of baptism. Does anybody know any of the other two? There's one called baptism by blood, <coughs> and it's generally reserved for the martyrs. Uh, these are the people that um, have not been baptized, but are dying for the faith. They believe in Jesus, they just haven't been baptized with water. They believe in Jesus, and they're put to death for their faith, and that's called baptism by blood. Uh, and a number of the early Christian martyrs uh, were, uh, were in that um, group. There's, a, there's another type, a third type, called um, baptism by desire. And this means... Um, there's somebody who is in the process of the catechumen, catechumenate, which basically means they're in the process of learning what it means to be a Christian, so then they can be baptized at the end of that process. Um, and something happens and they die in that time period while they're waiting to be baptized, and that's called the baptism by desire. They wanted to, it was their intention to, and they just hadn't been baptized yet, but um, they had... Um, um, they had fulfilled the quote-unquote requirements. Um, so baptism by water, baptism by blood, and baptism by desire. I would argue that there's a fourth way, and that's uh, which would be more when um, uh, we're uh, we're thrust into those situations that um, make us choose uh, 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 choose to not to accept grace not to choose to um, accept to be saved or anything, but when um, the, uh, the question is put to us of, um, of, of how we um, will uh, choose to live our life moving forward and, um, and uh, living as a Christian and a Christ follower, that it's, a, it's a, um, the baptism by fire that is talked about um, by John and others where... Uh, Jesus will baptize by the fire of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that um, could also baptize. One of the problems, I think, however, with infant baptism that we don't acknowledge enough is that in baptism we become a new person. That we, we do fully move from a place of comfort to a place of discomfort in that um, before baptism, we could live however we wanted to live. Whatever was good in our eyes is how we lived. But after baptism, we're a new creation. And we're a new creation in God. Meaning that we don't live for our own will, we live for God's will. And living for God's will, as we've heard, is not about comfort. But it's about, um, it's about doing good in the world. So we can't fully mark what our lives were like before baptism versus after baptism uh, for most of us. There's a trans transformational aspect that happens to us when we can understand what it means to be living a new life in Christ. How this shift from comfortability to discomfort is a part of what it means to live out our Christianity in the world. To accept what's coming in the world as, as God's will and how we, through the Holy Spirit, can acknowledge it and uh, attack those problems. 
So where in your life can you see transformation occurring? Where can, in your life, you see God at work and fully present? Each one of us has those things that we can see where God is at work in our lives. If we look hard enough, we can see where God was with us this last week or even this last day. Where God has been with us by that generous pouring out of the Holy Spirit for us. How has your life changed from your relationship with God, bringing you forward into eternal life now and forever? Amen.